high THC cannabis is much more productive for what we consider hemp, the fuel, fiber, and food aspect. And that's what marijuana prohibition is really about. It's not about drugs. That is just, pardon the pun, a smokescreen. Marijuana prohibition is really about money and power and the continued centralization of economic and political control. It's really about fuel and energy. And the people who gave us the lie and renamed hemp cannabis and started calling it marijuana are the petrochemical, pharmaceutical, military, industrial, transnational, corporate, elite, crony capitalist ruling class. And they made up the whole marijuana myth to feed us petroleum because with the invention of new machinery to harvest and process cannabis at the turn of the 20th century, back in the early 1900s, the price of hemp products dropped dramatically. Just the way the price of cotton dropped 100-fold with the invention of the cotton gin, the price of hemp dropped 100-fold with the invention of the decorticator to process hemp fi fiber mechanically. And that led to these, this new uh, campaign to criminalize what they called marijuana. And they took this term marijuana from an old Pancho Villa Mexican Revolutionary War song where they, you know, it's sung by Bugs Bunny in those cartoons off it, the La Cucaracha song, La Cucaracha. In that song, uh, they say that the, the cockroach smokes his marijuana and falls down. So they took this word from the petrochemical industry, by the way, did not like the fact that Mexico nationalized the petroleum industry when they took over in the 1911 revolution in Mexico. And so they took the, the, the oil barons took this word uh, and used the prominent racism that everyone basically believed in at the time, especially European Americans here in America. And uh, they used that to criminalize what, what they said was a deadly new drug. They didn't say it's the oldest crop, it's hemp. If they tried to criminalize hemp, it would never have worked. They said that marijuana is a deadly new drug that causes people to go crazy and kill their family and friends. Well, we know nothing could be farther from the truth. That is some of the lies, the misinformation campaign that led to ending marijuana prohibition. When we can restore hemp for its fuel attributes without consideration of the THC content in the flowers, but for the varieties that produce the most oil, the most protein, and the most fiber, and the highest quality of those, then instead of all of our money going to the world's largest industry is the energy industry. And it's controlled, you know, the largest corporations are uh, Exxon, Mobil, and Shell. Instead of all of our money going to them or to the Saudi sheiks, the Nigerian despots, it will go to our farmers. And instead of it going into their secret bank accounts, the farmers will spend it in their community. So the centralization of wealth really is caused by marijuana prohibition. When we can allow farmers to cultivate the most productive varieties of hemp, cannabis, marijuana, again, then uh, it's going to change the whole economic paradigm. And we're going to stop seeing the centralization of wealth and see its decentralization. We're going to uh, stop world hunger because the byproduct of creating hemp fuel is high protein vegetable uh, food. And we're gonna stop the deforestation with the byproduct from the, the fiber, the stalks and stems. So it really addresses all these different issues, but it also has to do with a more fundamental issue. And that is the freedom to think and live your life and feel the feelings that you want to feel if you're not harming another individual. We're talking about a plant that's been cultivated at least 12,000 years. According to some archaeological records, over 30,000 years, cannabis has been cultivated by human beings. All archaeologists agree it's at least 12,000. So we're talking about the oldest cultivated crop. There's no other crop that's been cultivated by people this long. But history 
and historians don't really acknowledge that. They don't talk, when they talk about the oldest crops, they rarely talk about hemp and cannabis, but it's the oldest cultivated crop. You know, it, it might have led to the domestication of, of farm animals. The fact that we had hemp seed and hemp leaf to feed those farm animals might have led to the domestication of horses and cattle. And so we learned agriculture from cannabis. It's the oldest crop. Then it's the most productive crop. It produces more protein and oil from the seed than any other crop. You know, they allow the cultivation of low THC hemp for fiber and food and fuel. But by limiting it to low THC hemp, the production of seed, which produces the protein and oil, is about 1 20th what high THC cannabis is, cult is capable of. And the production of fiber is about 50%. We didn't realize the benefit of hemp at first but that became apparent by the 1980s. And that just added fuel to the fire, so to speak. You know, it's like, gee, this is unbelievable how many different things hemp can do and how productive it is for fuel, fiber, food, and medicine. And so uh, I, I was just motivated even more to get involved in that. So realizing the diversity that hemp, diversity of products that hemp could produce I realized after doing some research that the Chinese uh, had the world's largest hemp crop at the time. And so I started studying Chinese in 1987 here at Evergreen State College. And I went to school in China in 1988, started making contacts to import hemp paper and fabric from China. Now they canceled all my classes and everybody else's in China in 1989 because of the Tiananmen Massacre. That happened not just in Beijing, but all across the whole country. Uh, there were riots and massacres all over the country. But uh, uh, in 1990, I was able to put together the first samples of hemp paper and fabric and then brought the first loads of hemp paper and fabric into uh, North America in, in 1991 first loads that had been imported in some time. It was Rope Walk Paper and Fiber Corporation and Tree Free Eco Paper. And if you look at a 1995 book by this fellow Rowan Robinson called uh, uh, The Great Book of Hemp, it lists my companies, uh, Tree Free Eco Paper, Rope Walk Paper and Fiber, as the first hemp companies in North America on page four and in that, that book. Cannabis has been cultivated for at least 12,000 years and maybe for more than 30,000 years. So we have changed cannabis. We've uh, altered its structure, picked out the attributes that we like, and uh, now uh, cannabis has also changed us. We've co-evolved with cannabis, and cannabis has co-evolved with us. The idea that hemp is separate from Marijuana is just a false dichotomy. Genetically, it's the same species. And so uh, we have chosen the, the varieties to meet our needs. And now humans' nutritional needs in terms of protein and amino acids perfectly matches hemp seeds, output of seeds for protein and amino acids. Humans' nutritional needs for essential fatty acids or EFAs uh, for our brain and circulatory system and entire body perfectly match better than any other plant food out there, uh, hemp seeds production of uh, EFAs. So we have chosen to cultivate the varieties to meet these needs, whether it be for fuel, for food, for fiber, for medicine, and for fun you know, for, for adult social use. And if you look at the basis of all religions, you will find cannabis at its very root. And uh, uh, Chris Bennett up in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, has written a number of volumes uh, about how cannabis is at the basis of all world religions. And so I really look at it, you know, as a plant that produces more uh, the oldest crop and the most productive crop. 
that Mother Earth has given us. And I think that's a sacred gift from our planet, from God, whatever term you want to use it, Gaia, Mother Earth. And to prohibit that is evil. And that's been one of my motivating uh, beliefs for a long time. There have been divisions for some time. You know, I advocated when I started my hemp companies back in the 80s and 90s, I advocated for low THC cannabis. And uh, there, you know, I was on several conference calls with farmers throughout the state last year talking about hemp farmers and cannabis farmers. And the fear of cannabis farmers that hemp is going to degrade their crop. Or really, I call low THC industrial hemp dwarf hemp. Because, like I said, it produces half the fiber and one twentieth of the seed. And so, uh, if you ever seen the low THC buds, they're just little teeny scraggly buds with some seeds sticking out. Look at our big cannabis indica buds. They're fat with lots of seeds in there. You know, so... Uh, Low THC is just a distraction, and it's completely useless. If, you, if we can grow hemp without regard to its THC content, uh, we'll be growing high THC cannabis, and we'll be harvesting the buds. Back in the 70s, when I was a teenager, I started selling pot. Bought my first pound when I was 13. And I started smoking at a babysitter's house when I was 11. And back in the 70s, though, we would get Colombian marijuana, and the best was all buds, but it was heavily seeded. So when you clean the seeds, it would be 50% seeds and 50% buds. Well, that's what will happen when we can grow high THC cannabis again. So if you harvest uh, 12,000 pounds of seed an acre from your high THC cannabis, and that's what it's capable of, you'll have 12,000 pounds of buds left over, and you'll have 50 uh, to 60 tons of, of fiber left over. So all of that could come out of one crop and that will go to our farmers. And uh, our farmers will be using those, the wealth that that creates to, uh, to enrich our communities. You know, one of the things I found in doing some research for Jack Harris' book is that Thomas Jefferson smuggled cannabis seeds out of Italy and brought them to America. And he patented a device to decorticate cannabis fiber. And he said in his papers that he anonymously published the patent to forestall any interloping uh, entrepreneurs from profiting from this device so that farmers could benefit around the world. And so uh, that's... Uh, the history of our country and uh, you know George Washington was a cannabis farmer uh, in doing that research I went to just Portland State University and they had these big compilations of all the correspondence and writings of Jefferson of Washington of Franklin and going through there they have an index book at the back the Library of Congress compiled these books at the 200th anniversary of each of their deaths so there are like 20 to 25 volumes of all their their uh, correspondence, both what they wrote and what they received. And so I just went to the index and looked up hemp and Indian hemp. I found all of these references that became part of Jack Hare's book, the last chapter of Chris Conrad's book, Hemp Lifeline to the Future. And so it's our heritage and it's our future. And uh, uh, we need it to happen for our environment, for our individual liberty, for so many different reasons.